So today's special topic is entitled Helicopter Pioneers Before 1914. And Yves Moret is on the phone with us uh, all the way from Germany. And he offered at our last meeting to share about some research that he's doing in this space. So I'm sure he would afterwards love to get any feedback on other information that complements the work that he's doing here. So at this point, I will turn this over to Eves to, uh, to give you all uh, this overview. Thank you, Eves. over to you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm very happy to, to participate in this, uh, in this committee. And I, I wish also to thank you for your, your support in, uh, in, passing, in passing the slides. Mm -hmm. So can we have the next one, please? So the idea which I, I tried to, to go through, perhaps a bit ambitious, was to try to create a, a sort of chronology uh, based on um, aircraft flights or aircraft development or toys development between ancient China to 1914. I stopped at 1914 because afterwards there, there was a war which actually stopped much of uh, the vertical, uh, which is the, the helicopter development. It started again after, as I'm sure you know. So it's a bit of a, an ambitious objective. I identified 68 different projects. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, it's still a lot of work in progress, so I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking at different material that I have, mostly books that I, that I found. I've also used uh, so sources on the, on the uh, internet and also had a, a quick look at the Vertipedia, which is a very, very useful tool. I've tried to put one slide per pioneer project. So with a little bit of text, mostly describing the project and when available, a picture. They are not always of a very good, very good quality uh, because uh, all of this is a, bit, uh, is a bit homemade. What is clear is that most of these remain projects, even toys actually, uh, which were having names like Spiralifer or Strophor in, in French to, 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 to show that they were in fact, you flying in a, uh, you using using a cord that you 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 tow in order to launch the, uh, the the device and and scale models um, so there were different means to to power it for example clockwork mechanism or steam engine uh, steam engines were very much at the modern at the time being of course also human engine uh, rubber, that mostly for the toy, gunpowder, there was one project that was using actually gunpowder as a, as a propulsion mean, mm. jet from the rotor tips, uh, internal combustion gas turbine, compressed air, electricity, desert, and in some cases, the, the, mo the mode of propulsion is at least unclear, unclear to me, and that's probably one of the, the big issues that existed during that period was a lack of uh, suitable engines uh, in order to, to develop aircraft that could fly. Only a limited number were manned. Uh, Cornu in 1907, Breguet Richet was manned, but uh, one of you told me that they were not sure that it actually fly even tethered and if it was not helped by helpers to, to fly. Elle Hammer is a Danish citizen who actually had his own machine and uh, a Russian guy because Yuryev, which I think was, was close also to, to flying. Next slide. Uh, I tried to look at the, at the technical and theoretical development during that period. Uh, a French mathematician, uh, the name looked quite English, but he is, is French, Monsieur Pocton, in 1786 developed the theory of Archimedes' crew. Actually, he tried to develop its own helicopter. Uh, in 1870, a uh, French scientist was working on propeller operation. Where, when you look at the, the documentation of that time, they speak a lot about, at least in the French documentation, about propellers, about hélice, which is quite, uh, the, the, the French term was hélice, and uh, so I've translated by propellers, but in some cases, it's actually rotor. 
the propeller theory was further developed for the for the for the maritime activity by William Rankin, William Froude, and Robert Froude, the son of the of, of William. Uh, one big progress that we, which in fact started to materialize only at the beginning of uh, the 20th century for at least uh, aircraft, was the development of the internal combustion engine, which during the period 1860 to 90, 1900 was developed by Lenoir in France, Otto, Daimler, Diesel and Benz in, uh, in, in Germany. And uh, by the way, at the same time, we were starting to see cars using those uh, those um, those um, engines. Uh, Edison, the uh, the Edison, in fact, did some study which indicated that uh, in order to 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 a low flight, the engine must to power would have to remain between all. 1.2 and 1.8 kilo per horsepower. And as a, as a reference, a piston engine, evolved piston engine was 0.5 kilo per horsepower and turbine engine, modern turbine engine, 200 gram per horsepower. So he did some calculation indicating that in fact, most of the steam engine that were there at that time were too heavy actually to, to allow to fly. People look also at the various um, uh, the functioning of, uh, of blades. In particular, in looked at the flapping of propeller blades, identified that it was helpful in order to, to, to have a good functioning of uh, the blades that were providing sustentation, but it didn't develop a technical, a technical device. Next slide, please. Uh, in 1904, the well-known Russian aerodynamicist, Zhukovsky, uh, this is probably the French writing, it's probably Zhukovsky in English, uh, started to, to, to look at various items in relation to helicopter. 1904, it's about the payload. Then he looked at how the wingtip workers were behaving. An Italian scientist also developed and patented the concept of cyclic, cyclic pitch in 1906, so identified uh, the problem, but also identified a solution. Yukovsky went on with a rotor theory with a large number of blades in 1907. A Spanish gentleman was making left measurement of pro propeller used for sustentation. Breguet, uh, Louis Breguet of uh, Breguet fame, uh, the, he is from a big family of industrial uh, clockmakers from uh, the King of France, and uh, er he was also a clockmaker, but in the, he's more famous for the Breguet Company that uh, was quite one of prominent French company in the 20th century. And Nukovsky continued in 1909 to look at uh, what was the analysis of forward flight speed on the rotor flow. So that's some of the technical development. You see a, an acceleration around the beginning of the 1900, which we could say we, we moved certainly at that time into a more scientific, scientific approach. Next slide, Bob. I also had to look at the progress on learned society, like the vertical flight society. And probably the first one was a French one uh, called Société Aerostatique et Météorologique de France, which is French Aerostatic and Meteorological Society, founded in 1852. Uh, it was, aerostatic means balloon, but uh, in fact, it dealt with uh, all flying devices. And in 1872, it became the French Society for Air Navigation, which survived until, I think, until the 1930s. In 1863 uh, was at least important in the French uh, in the French context. Uh, quite an enthusiast mm. photographer was a, a photographer Nadar, who is in fact was a balloonist. He was an aeronaut, but he was also the first person who took a picture from a balloon. Uh, was convinced that heavier than air was much better than lighter than air, and you know that at that period starting with, 
with the Frère Montgolfier in 1783, lighter than air was probably the, the most, at that time, practical mean, if I can say so, mean to fly. And Nadar was convinced of the contrary, that heavier than air was the, the solution. And he developed a, a manifesto in which he said that propellers will ensure sustentation of heavier than air, the effort should be there, and actually receive support from scientists from the French Science Academy. 1868 was the first aeronautical exhibition in the Crystal Palace in London, organized by the Royal Aeronautical Society, which was created in 1866. And there was some, I would say, at least exhibit on helicopters. Same happened at the first Salon of Aeronautique in France. So what is called today the Paris Air Show, 1908. And there was at least models of helicopters that were being, being presented. Most of the aircraft were fixed wing. And the last point I wanted to mention here was that there was apparently an international permanent commission of aeronautics that organized a competition to improve safety and oriented research toward rotorcraft because they made, they found that fixed wing aircraft were crashing quite frequently. There were technical reasons. There were also piloting reason and they thought that a way, and a way to improve safety, to improve the low speed safety, would in fact to develop uh, an effort towards rotorcraft. Unfortunately, the war came and probably not much came out of it, but it's interesting to see that already in 1914, safety was forefront in aviation activities and people were thinking that in fact, rotorcraft with the possibility to fly slowly or to stop, to stop in flight, would be uh, providing more safety than fixed wing. Next slide, please. So what occurred in China was basically a toy. It's also called bamboo copter or dragonfly or Chinese top. It has different, uh, different name. And it's something that works when you spin it rapidly on its axle, it, it fly. It's, uh, it's a toy. Uh, on the right is a modern version in, in plastic. And the first description of it was in 400 B before Christus in China and Japan. Next one, Bob. I hesitated to put that because that obviously doesn't fly, but was windmills. Windmills were introduced uh, coming from, uh, from Asia in Europe, probably around the 13th century. And uh, I, because I read that at least in two books, I thought it may not be, it was not perhaps entirely stupid to mention them because actually it can contribute to the idea that the propeller can produce work. Those windmills were used to grind corn or in the Netherlands. And the one on the, on the right is, a, is one in the Netherlands, was used to pump water. You may know that in, in Holland, uh, the, the distinction between water and land is somewhat blurred. So, Windmills were the tool that the Dutch were using in order to, to reclaim land. And you can see it, it's a big propeller. It has obviously a spar, it has obviously a, a, a leading edge, it has ribs, and you can have claws that is put, on the, uh, put on, the, uh, on the blade in order to have more power. So probably it contributed in, in that context. It may be a bit uh, far-fetched, but I think it, there may be some, some logic behind it. Next, please, Bob. Okay, this is, a, this is a, an extract of an altarpiece, which is located in a, in a museum in Le Mans. Le Mans is a city in France, which is well known for uh, racing 24 hours of Le Mans. And in this altarpiece, you can see a kid which is playing with a little toy, which really looks like the bamboo toy from, uh, from the... Uh, the um, Chinese and this uh, this altarpiece is dated 1460. So obviously this is a toy, but we will see that the idea was used later on by uh, by scientific people in order to to look at vertical flight. Next slide, please. Of course, the next stop is obviously Leonardo da Vinci, circa 1480. Uh, Leonardo started to study bird flights like many other, uh, many other 
pioneers, Lilienthal also started by looking at bird flight. He concluded that looking at the, the strength of bird, relative strength compared to the relative strength of a human being, ornithopters, so flying, flapping wings would not fly. And as he had noted that when you rotate a screw fast, it can lift itself to a certain extent. It de he developed a, a model aircraft that he said was able to fly. In fact, the full model is man powered. You may not see it very well, but there is a below the two rotors, there is a, a place where four human beings can take place and rotate, uh, rotate the whole thing. What is interesting is that a drone, a very small one, to, to be honest, recently proved it and I've uh, put here a picture and, uh, and uh, provided the link where you can see that this very small one has proven that the device from Leonardo was was able to able to fly. And Next slide, drone, please. Just FYI, that drone was uh, developed for uh, well, in the as a result of the VFS student competition. So, so we yes. proved it could work. Thank you, Mike. That's a good a good compliment. I was, I had something in the back of my mind saying that comes from VFS. I was not sure. Thank you for contributing. I appreciate that very much. Next, Bob. Then uh, a French scientist, Christian de Launois, he was a naturalist actually, uh, and his mechanic, Monsieur Bienvenu, in 1784, developed in fact a coaxial version of the bamboo copter. They had realized that if you wanted the, the thing to not to rotate on itself, you had to put two counter rotating uh, rotors. The blades were made of turkey feathers. He apparently demonstrated it to the, to the Science Academy, and afterwards, this device was furthered by some French uh, people uh, in the 19th, 19th century. But probably more importantly, the device from Monsieur de Launois was uh, further developed by Sir George Cayle, and if you can move to the next slide, Bob, which developed a very comparable device in uh, 17. 196, uh, so very similar. And what is interesting is, okay, Cayley is probably, my humble opinion, the, the, the founding father of, uh, of aviation because he developed ideas like the dihedral. He developed the idea of a monoplane with a tail in order to have, a, to have um, stability. He probably, uh, some of his model, fixed wing model flew and probably one with his, uh, with this, uh, the, the driver of his coach flew. Uh, so he, he developed a lot of ideas and he also, and we will see that later on, in addition to that, what is really a toy, developed a more ambitious project in 18, 1843, actually a convertible. It didn't flew, but he went up to, up to that. So if can, we can move to the next slide, Bob, please. An Italian, Vittorio Sarti, uh, in particular in Bologna, so north of Italy, uh, he worked on the use of propellers on balloons and, uh, and helicopter. Uh, and what he designed, it's a picture is here, it's an helicopter, but also an, orth an ornithopter, because the blades could, could flap. He called the, his, 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 his device an aerosailing ship and uh, the, what you see at the, on the right is sort of counterweight in order to to help to balance to balance the device. Allegedly, the, the thing could uh, could fly, or a model of it could fly. Next, please. Uh, interestingly, 1842, Mr. Phillips, uh, he was the fire extinguisher manufacturer, and he is famous for that actually developed a model with contra-rotating rotor, hollow blade, and using a gas that was escaping, if I understood properly, at the trailing edge that would propel the rotor. The gas was produced by the combustion of coal, saltpeter, and gypsum, which are in fact things that he also was using in his, uh, in his fire extinguishers. According to witnesses, it flew 100 meters, 300 feet, and reach a height of 30 meters 
before the blades uh, went to, went away, so they, they, they broke away, and the device uh, crashed. But an interesting an interesting attempt, of course, using gas to propel rotor has been used in the 20th century by several uh, several designers uh, in order, in particular, to 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 escape having to put a, a tail a tail rotor. Next, Bob, please. So the, this one is from George Cayley, what I was mentioning before. So it is a it is a convertible in the sense that the four rotor can become wings in flight. So you, you can see that the blades can be separated, but if you, if you stop them, it can be a fixed surface. And there was two propelling two propellers. You can see them in the middle of the ship, and those two propellers were used to propel the ship. The only problem is that there is a tail, there is a, there is a, a rudder. The only problem is that <clears throat> the engine is not mentioned. But interestingly, it was a it could take off vertically and it then could could flew using its wings. So it's probably would probably qualify as a as a convertible today. Next slide, please. Now here is probably more the work of a visionary, a French visionary, Gabriel de la Landelle. Uh, he was a sailor, in fact, he was a sailor. He was also a writer, so he was, a, he was uh, working in the French uh, merchant navy. And he wrote books about uh, merchant navy, about stories of sailors. But he wrote a book, Created Aviation. aviation. And uh, according to a, a thesis I found, he may have, by that way, created the work aviation in 19, 1953. But he, he was a very good, very big proponent of uh, heavier than air. And together with uh, Vicomte Ponton d'Amécourt, I will come back to, to him in a, in a few minutes, and, Nata, and Nadar again, the, the photographer, he designed a, a flying packet ship operated by, by steam. Needless to say, this is too heavy. And, but it was, a, it was a first idea. You can see the vertical propellers. You can see also the, the wings. What is interesting, but that's a, a supposition from mine, is that this uh, ship, flying ship, was served as a model of uh, the aircraft invented by Jules Verne in a, in a book called Robur le Conquérant. You know, Jules Verne is a, quite a famous French uh, writer of, uh, we could say today, science fiction. It's uh, when I was a kid, uh, I've read probably 25 of his books. And one of them is Robur le Conquérant, who is a man who has developed a ship, who is flying in the air. And uh, the whole story is about the flight of that ship, which is probably powered by a propeller, you can see at the end of the ship, and supported by 74 propellers at the top of mast. Um, 1886, so he could have taken his inspiration from the what was designed by Monsieur de la Landelle, but basically Monsieur de la Landelle was trying to promote heavier than air at a time where the effort was more on the uh, lighter than air. Next one, Bob. Now, Ponton d'Amécourt uh, developed a two, mod two models. These are really toys. One was powered by a clock mechanism, that's the one on the left, so counter-rotating. But he worked with a, uh, a mechanics called Mr. Joseph. And uh, Mr. Joseph, in fact, designed a steam engine with a mass of two kilo that was able to propel the, the two rotors, and you, you can see uh, a copy of a, a picture of a, of a lithography of that model, which is uh, taken from a book that I have dated 1910, which, called, which is called La Navigation Aérienne, Air Navigation, which recalls, in fact, the history until 1910. It's quite, it's quite written in a nice way, not much pictures, mostly, mostly engravings. Uh, Ponton d'Amécourt, most likely, according to the same, same research work I did, which was performed by a, a scientist, a linguist in uh, 1965, created the word helicopter from the, the Greek helix. So all those designs that you, you see here are in French are called helices. 
a list of sustentation, sustenting propeller, or when they are, uh, when they are uh, used for forward flight, they are uh, propeller for propulsion. And so the word, the Greek word elix has given the French word elis. And in fact, in the dictionary of that, of that, of those days, you can see that it is a, something with wings in the shape of a propeller. So that's probably where the, work, the word helicopter comes, uh, probably a period of uh, 1861, 1863. I, I've got all the references if you're interested because he, the linguist ref, dutifully checked all of them and noted them in his book. Next, please. Bright, an Englishman, so I put it here, counter-rotating rotors. Interesting, the first helicopter patent granted by the British Patent Office, but he didn't found any uh, appropriate engine, so he, he didn't flew. So just to show that the French were not the only one working on, a, on helicopters, uh, in case you would be suspicious that I'm being French, I'm only, only promoting the French history. Next one, please. Nelson, this is an American guy, four rotor mont mounted on two masts. The, the inclination of the mast can be modified in order that the rotors can also be used for propulsion, so it's also a convertible. It was equipped, according to what I read, by a buoyant sail. I don't know exactly what it is, but it seems to be something like a, which have provided maybe a sort of inflatable device that could have been providing some sustentation. In case, of, uh, in case of failure. It's built of aluminum, was built in New York, covered by a patent, didn't find an appropriate engine, so didn't fly, but was intended to be used during the Civil War for the unions. In fact, at that period, I've been able to identify uh, one other device developed for the same purpose in the union and one developed for the Confederate. So people were starting to imagine a, a military use for uh, helicopters. Next one, please, Bob. Peno, Peno, this is a French guy again. Uh, he developed toys, in fact. Uh, credit of this picture is from the National Aerospace Museum. Uh, the, his toy was adapted by a toy manufacturer, Monsieur Dandrieux, uh, who developed many toys that were actually quite successful. And uh, it was found in, uh, in the house where his uh, niece was, uh, was living in Brest, in Brittany, in, uh, during, after the Second World War, a letter that he had written in which he was describing what could have been a tilt rotor. So it's written in a letter. There is no further proof of the existence of a possible model. He worked also on fixed wing aircraft, Plano 4, and uh, what is interesting is that this work was uh, recorded by Octave Chanut uh, and the Wright brothers, actually one of his toys that were given by their father when they were kids. So the, he was probably a bit influencing the, the, their work and their thinking, uh, albeit he had only developed toys. In fact, it's a, a tragic figure, but it's a very brilliant man who was misunderstood. He was not able to, to get any credit or success for what he was doing and committed suicide at the age of 30 after having sent all his documentation to another important man in the, in the French aviation, Henri Giffard, who was more working on, uh, on uh, airships. That was Monsieur Penault, perhaps would, I, would he have lived, lived? Would have he developed perhaps further his, uh, his material? We, we will never know. Next, please. Uh, Pomesse de la Pose, that's their system. It was powered by gunpowder. I don't have much to say about it, so perhaps we can move to the next slide, but it was a, an interesting thing. This one is a German, Achenbach, uh, and he had a transversal propeller for stabilization and was using a steam engine. It remained the project. Next one, please. Enrico Forlanini, an Italian, 1877. It's a model with uh, two bladed rotors, a steam engine with a mass of 1.5 kilos, a boiler was one kilo, the maximum mass was 3.5 kilos, and apparently it flew up to a height of 13 meters for 20 or 30 seconds, depending from, uh, from the sources. 
Next one, Bob. Uh, this one, I don't have much about it. It's an helicopter which has been developed by the French engineer in 1877. In fact, it was using a gas turbine, which was using the product of combustion of air and ether. At the top is the, I would say, the rotor. If one could say that, that it has quite a, a complicated form. And you can see also the propulsive propeller, which is in the middle, in the middle of the device. Next one, please. Greenhoff, uh, this one I don't have much about it, but it has, in my view, quite a modern configuration. Uh, it looks like a quadcopter, except it has only two rotors, but which are installed into, into the wing. So it's, a, you could say, quite a futuristic, uh, futuristic design, but I, I, don't think it, uh, I don't think it flew, it flew at all and remember, remind probably what is a patent, because that looks like a drawing from a, from a patent. Next, please. Parsons is the inventor of the steam turbine. He developed a model helicopter with a steam engine of one fourth of a horsepower, which reached a height of 3.5 meters and flew accordingly 100, 100 meters. So we're coming now close to the, to the end of the 19th century. Next one, please. Colonel Renard. So that's the start where the military were getting involved, at least in France. Uh, he developed a theory of propeller. He anticipated uh, um, a fixed wing and rotor equipped aircraft, presented his work to the Science Academy. He built a prototype with two rotors side by side, powered by a two cylinder piston engine. This is a, a picture of his, uh, of his device. He invented, as I mentioned before, articulated blade, but he's also famous for having set up the first military establishment in France about aviation, which was a military balloon central establishment in chalet -Meudon. And he also worked on electric airship. He developed an airship that was pro propelled by electricity. Next one, please. Léger, oh, that's an interesting device. Uh, it was sponsored by the Prince, uh, yes, the Prince of Monaco. You may know this principality uh, known for gaming, Monte Carlo in particular. The Prince of Monte Carlo sponsored the guy to develop an, helico an electric helicopter, which is represented on the, on the picture, which was obviously tethered, and that was able to flew a payload of 100 kilos. So it would have been able to, 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 to lift a man. Unfortunately, it crashed into a lake in 1906 and was not, uh, was not continued. But an interesting device in 1905 uh, first, perhaps, application, if you, if you take out uh, the airship, of electricity uh, to, to, power, to power an aircraft. Next one, please. Santos Dumont, who is uh, also a famous, uh, a famous uh, aviation pioneer. Uh, he performed the first sustained flight, recorded flight in Europe. So they were official uh, uh, judges from... Uh, uh, the Federation Aeronautical uh, uh, International, so the International Air Federation that were there and recorded his flight, 200 meters. Uh, he looked at uh, everything that has to do with aviation, being a rather wealthy man, owning a plantation in Brazil. And uh, he developed aircraft, he developed, air he developed aeroplanes, he developed airships. And also, he started to look at, uh, at a, um, a helicopter with two horizontal propellers. You, you can see here the, the aircraft under construction. Uh, should be should have been equipped with an Antoinette engine of 24 horsepower. Antoinette was the engine installed on several other uh, fixed-wing aircraft in France. But the power was insufficient to, to lift the expected weight, 170 kilo of the machine which was actually quite a flimsy weight and probably would not have been very robust. And he abandoned and decided to develop the fixed wing aircraft, which was much more successful, called the Demoiselle, the Mistress. So that was for Santos Dumont. So again, no real, uh, no real flight. Next one, please. Uh, just a mention of Polish pioneers. One is Joseph Lipkowski, 1905. The, his device is shown on the, on the top here. 
I don't have much about it. It was developed in Russia. Remember, at that time, Poland didn't exist and was, and was developed for people working in St. Petersburg. I don't know if it flew or not. The other one was Cheshkov Stansky, 1907, who, who developed a sort of man-powered uh, twin rotor, twin rotor device. Here also have some doubt if that flew, but Polish, Poland, the device it didn't exist. There were people looking at, uh, looking at aviation at that time. Next, please. Switzerland now, the brothers Dufault, in 1905, they developed a model who flew successfully in 1905. They further developed uh, fixed wing aircraft and are considered as being the, uh, the father of uh, aviation in, uh, in, in Switzerland. Next one, please. Breguet-Richet, so that uh, was uh, a quadcopter, we would say today, with a twin, with biplane, uh, biplane rotors. It was manned, the man was seated in the middle of the, of the contraption. It flew only tethered. According to what I read, it was able to fly, but one of you told me that uh, it's not impossible that the helper actually helped the engine to the, the device to fly. But actually, it was not really controllable. Uh, it was able, it probably showed that it can, uh, I would say, reach a certain height, but there was no real control. It was quite heavy, 578 kilos, and was again equipped with an Antoinette, uh, 40, 45 horsepower. Next one, Bob, please. And Paul Cornu, or Paul Cornu, is a, he was a bicycle manufacturer. It's probably interesting to mention. He was working not in Paris, like many others. He was, uh, he was working in Normandy. Uh, and he worked quite alone, developed a manned helicopter. You see the picture here, which was capable of free flight. He was able to take off vertically up to a height of 1.5 meters. It was witnessed by official witness, including the mayor of a mayor of, a little, of villages. But this device had no effective control. So it was probably not a practical proposition, uh, relatively heavy and an Antoinette engine, 24 horsepower. But he is considered in history as being the one who flew first an helicopter. Next one, please. There were also Romanian pioneers. I listed uh, five of them mm -hmm. and show here three of their, uh, three of their design. The last one, Trajan Vuia, is uh, considered also to be quite a pioneer in, uh, uh, in aviation. He also developed fixed wing, fixed wing aircraft. Next one, please, Bob. Achille Bertelli, Italian. Uh, his aircraft was 600 kilos, um, equipped with an engine of 24 horsepower perform unsuccessful tests because of lack of power. He had two patents about uh, helicopters and also he developed, he developed a kite, kite balloon called Aerostain. But uh, this, this one was man, you can see the man sitting in his device, but it, it was quite well developed, but uh, was, not, uh, was not able to fly again due to lack, uh, lack of power. Next one, please. Igor Sikorsky, we, we have to mention him, two devices, uh, equipped both with a 25 horsepower Anzani. Anzani was a manufacturer of the aircraft, that, of the engine that was used by Blériot to fly over the, over the English Channel. He tested it for two months, but was not satisfied because uh, he was found, it was found too heavy by, by him, so it stopped its development and started to develop another one, the S2. And if Bob can show the next slide. Uh, 1910, uh, more elaborated machine than the S2, uh, built of aluminum, mm -hmm. still with the same engine, but unfortunately was, uh, was again too heavy. And apparently that convinced Sikorsky to stop for a while because later on in the thirties, he started again Developing, uh, developing helicopters. He developed for the uh, Russian army of the Tsar, the well-known four-engine uh, aircraft uh, known as Bolshoi the, the Great. But for a while, he stopped, uh, 
he stopped fixed wing, uh, fixed wing, he stopped uh, rotary wing aircraft. Next one, please. Boris Yuryev is also another Russian guy. Uh, there are others, which I, uh, you could see in the, in the complete presentation. Uh, he developed a, a single rotor helicopter. What is interesting is that uh, at least a version of 1912 would have been equipped with a, with a tail rotor. Apparently, he performed only ground, ground tests. Uh, there again, Yuryev is written with a French wording. It's probably Yuryev with a, with a G like uh, Juliet uh, in, the, in English. Next, please. Uh, a Danish guy, Jakob Elhammer. He, he, was, he's, he apparently flew a fixed wing aircraft in 1903, just, uh, just short hops, but developed a helicopter with coaxial rotors. One of the rotors could be used as a parachute with an engine of his own design. Uh, perhaps the first example mm -hmm. of, of cyclic, cyclic controls tested until 1916, then he stopped and was apparently capable of short hops. Okay, next one, Bob, please. Okay, as a summary, uh, okay, there is uh, in this uh, presentation and uh, many slides have been hidden, 68 uh, projects which were mostly the work of individuals or people working with one or two people. Uh, a period that became very active was around 1750 uh, in various countries of the world, France, UK, USA, uh, later on in, uh, in Russia, Poland, uh, Romania. More scientific uh, thinking started in uh, 18, 1850 and probably being even more active in 900, 1900. More practical helicopter, if we can say, started after 1900, but still they were lacking adapted engine. World War, World War I stopped research, except in Austria, where a military engineer developed an helicopter who did actually, actually fly during the war. But the development of uh, helicopters or autogyro started in, uh, in the 1920s with uh, Juan de la Sierva and, and others, and Sikorsky later on in the 30s. So you see, this is a work in progress. Uh, I need to further work on biographies. I need to find also better pictures. This was homemade. I may also need perhaps to identify other projects. And for that, I was trying to look at patents during uh, 1850 and uh, 1915, and I found more than 2,000 projects. So that could be a could be a further work later on. So I think that's my last slide. I hope I was not too long. Thank you for your attention and I welcome any comments and, uh, and reaction. Thank you. Well done. Oh, thank you. Questions, comments? Yeah, I have a couple, Bob. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Eve? I'm so, I was surprised that you didn't uh, include uh, Mikhail Lomonosov because he apparently had a mechanical device that he demonstrated on a string uh, in 1754. And there's a report of it for the Russian Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. And I mention it um, because it's probably the first uh, illustration of a, a contra rotating propeller. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and so it's important from that standpoint the other thing is that um, the picture that you showed from 1460, uh, you should, there was a paper done many years ago um, for the uh, Helicopter Society uh, by Eugene Libertor. Um, you know, send me an email and I'll send you all these references. Uh, Eugene Libertor wrote on that and he, may, he maintains that, um, and he gives a, an illustration from a medieval manuscript and he cites a paper in which the claim is made that that thing never flew. It's a noisemaker. Okay. Uh, it's generic, interesting. Um, and that uh, the first instance you have of the Chinese top is actually towards the end of his life was patented by Cayley. And it's significant because it's, they say it's, it was the first uh, toy that used tin. The rotors were tin so he could adjust the pitch. And he actually conducted experiments where he would look at different you know, incidences uh, and, uh, and give it a fly. The other thing is that the, um, 
that picture that you showed of uh, Leger, the Leger helicopter. Yeah. The reason that most people ignore it is because it didn't have a motor. It was powered by electricity. You know, it had a, a shaft uh, from a, a you know generator, but the man standing next to him to his left is Jules Rogers, and he's the first. He he, he actually got lifted off the ground because the prince, okay. the prince of Monaco, uh, records it. You know, in his diary, that uh, which I think I mean I I think he should be remembered, the first human being to be lifted off the ground, other than perhaps Icarus. Um, in a rotary wing aircraft. The other thing is that um, I'm trying to think. You should take a look at um, Jean Boulet's book and Eugene Libertor's book, Helicopters Before the Helicopter. They both wrote on it. I think they've got some references that will prove very, very helpful. Um, okay. I did a I did a, a long paper which encompasses some of that for um, uh, a foreign policy institute in many years ago. I mean, we're talking like 300 pages um, on that, covering some of that history, um, uh, which I can, I'll send it to you, but it's 30, it's 36, uh, you know, megabytes. So I don't, okay. I don't know if I, I can send an email. Um, if you can figure out a way, if you've, you know, if you've got Dropbox or something, I'll send you the manuscript, uh, mm -hmm. make use of it, but it's got, it's got a lot of footnotes and references. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, Bruce. I appreciate very much your comments. In fact, I had identified Le Monosource, but I didn't show it because I, I wanted to provide the link between Le Noir and Kylie. But Le Monosource is in part of the hidden, slide, hidden slides. Okay. The other thing that you um, you should be aware of, I, I've, ma I've uh, maintained with a certain degree of humor that the uh, uh, um, what was the one with the rubber band? It's by Pungton. Yeah, Pungton, uh, yeah. Yeah, is perhaps the most important uh, rotary aircraft in history. Why? Because in a letter in 1931, uh, Orville Wright, at the bottom of the letter, he puts a diagram of a version of that was a toy that uh, his father gave to the two Wright brothers when they were kids. And he claims that that was what inspired them to go into aviation. Okay, thank you. My source said that they had got a toy. I mentioned it on the slide, but I didn't dare to say that it influenced their career. I, I was I was not sure of that. But if he said so, that's great. I, I, well, I'll I can send you a uh, a reference on that. Um, anyway, uh, if you you know find a way for me to send this to you, I think it's got mm -hmm. some references that you can make use of. Steal it all. Okay, thank you very much. I will do it. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Hi, Eves. I, I uh, have a question. Um, just want to bring it up real quick. Uh, thank you for the, the talk. You introduced me into some designs I was not aware of. Really awesome stuff. Um, during your research, did you come across um, concerns by the inventors and designers of the lack of progress in engine development. For example, many of the designs you know, were underpowered. And we're even seeing that today, like with the introduction of ITAC, which is what we have today, isn't enough to power or provide the power that we would like to have and to provide the performance for the aircraft that we're flying today. So was there some sort of concurrent desire from the designers to impress upon, I guess, automobile manufacturers at the time or whatever else they were using to, to create more powerful engines for their work, or they were just sort of like, ah, that's it. I, um, the, the impression I had was it could be, that's it. It's, uh, uh, you know, engine manufacturer, uh, cars manufacturer started at the end of the 19th century. So for many of them, the only thing that was actually available was a steam engine. And uh, uh, I have not seen, well, all, or human strength, or some odd things like gunpowder, or uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I didn't find any uh, any particular note into that, that direction. They, they, they concluded, okay, we, we are all lacking power, and that was probably with the apparition of the piston engine, which could be made much lighter. That mm -hmm. also it was also true for aircraft. Huh? The, uh, aircraft, airships, the arrival of uh, piston engine really helped to, 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 to develop aviation. The, the, 
steam engine, they, for example, Adair was supposed to have flown with a steam engine, uh, was, was probably an, a non-starter for, uh, for aircraft. <laughs> True. <laughs> Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions for Eves? I was thinking I should probably send you a copy of the paper I did back in 2014 on the John Newton Williams helicopter of 1908 that he did with Glenn Hammond Curtis. Are you familiar with that, sir? Uh, Glenn Curtis, yes. I'm, I'm familiar with it, yes. Yeah, and then the follow-on, which did lift the person, in fact, the vertical flight heritage site now in Hammond's port that VFS commemorates that with. And also in 1909, a follow-on effort with Berliner down in New York City. There was another helicopter developed, okay. which lifted Newton, John Newton Williams, three times. So I'll send you the paper. You can look okay. at it. A lot, of, a lot of good photos and stuff in it. Thank you very much for your support. I do I do appreciate Yes, I was quite sure I had not identified all and, all and everything. But thank you for your support. This is quite detailed. You, you'll enjoy it, I think. I hope. <laughs> okay. I will. I yeah. will, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Eves, this is Mike Hirschberg. I just wanted to say thank you for giving this presentation. Uh, you know, 63 slides of uh, exciting early developments. It's quite a compendium you've uh, you've assembled and presented. And uh, I think the comments today will help you make that even more expansive. So, um, you know, nice job. And thanks for letting us all know about these uh, very interesting early projects. Thank you very much, Mike. I, I do appreciate it and I look forward to, to improve this, uh, this document. Thank you very much. And one further suggestion, if you might want to look at the archive of papers that have been done for the uh, you know, American Helicopter Society and the Vertical Flight Society. There are a couple of engineering papers by uh, J. Gordon Leishman in which he takes a look at the Bruguet and the Cornu. Okay. Um, he has some different conclusions about whether they really flew and claims that the, um, the famous picture of the Bruguet does, does not show, A, he does a mechanical analysis and says it, 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 it couldn't have flown, but uh, contrary to apparently some of the claims that you make, um, he claims that there's no mention of it, there's no witness, official witness um, of a flight and that the, the famous picture that's shown only shows at best two wheels off the ground. It doesn't show all four. Um, whether you accept them or not, and you're in a much better position to know whether the engineering analysis is correct, um, there are at least uh, two papers that we have okay. that uh, you know might be beneficial to look at. Okay, I, I will do so, thank you. I, for Cornu, I believe, uh, that there were, well, officials, not perhaps a trained official, but at least uh, um, uh, mayors of little village around that actually witnessed the thing flying. But I, I will have a, I will have a look at it. Well, in, um, I don't know whether it's the Libertor. I think it's in the in the um, Boulet book. Okay. Uh, he quotes, and the son of an engineer who over who heard his father describing a conversation with old man Bruguet okay. uh, in which um, they were laughing and the claim was made, the famous photo, he said, the, uh, the four guys are not holding it down. They're holding they're it helping. up. They're <laughs> helping. Okay. But uh, Thank you know, you. if you're going to, I mean, I, I think that the gold standard uh, you know, are, is the Libertor book and the, and the Boulet okay. book. Um, they will add to uh, what you're doing. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I must tell you, by the way, I met Bruguet's grandson or great grandson, and I described that to him. I met him at one of our meetings, I think in Montreal, over the cocktail hour, and I described what had been written, and he gave me his card, and I um, scanned it and sent it to him, and not ever, never heard from him again. Oh, that's a that's a pity. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, my well, Eve, thank you so much. And I love this kind of dialogue that we can just exchange. Uh, we can exchange our, our knowledge, what we know of past papers to help us uh, strengthen, strengthen presentations like this. So thanks everybody for your inputs.